It's that same genetic variation which is also the cause of cancers and of genetic diseases and so forth. So inevitable consequences of living in a carbon-based life world. Uh, just to give you a little inkling of that, this is a study um, which was published recently. Um, actually, it was the first sort of systematic study of looking at all the cancerous mutations in a specific collection of genes that encode uh, a collection of enzymes called kinases. There are 518 kinase encoding genes. This were, they were analyzed from 210 different cancers. They identified this group who was looking at this, identified 1,000 mutations and 158 were identified as actual drivers of carcinogenesis in those particular cancers. So, so this is a, a huge, you know, a huge element within the whole process of cancer. In anthropic accounts of the fine-tuning of the physical constants of the universe, we often hear of Fred Hoyle's discovery of the precise resonances in carbon that had to exist without which you would not get the synthesis of carbon from, uh, from helium var beryllium in the, in the moment, dying moments of exploding stars. So in a sense, you could say that not only um, carbon-based life is tied up with that whole anthropic principle, but also carbon-based death as well. Biology really is a package deal. Physical death is part of that deal. And so, of course, equally, physical life and death have been intimately involved in our own emergence um, as humankind, as a separate species, and the, our common inheritance from the apes is about as certain as anything you can be uh, in biology, in evolutionary biology. I mean, it is like we can go, I won't stop on this slide now because it's a little bit technical, but if anyone wants to talk about that, we can. I mean, the genetic data of the past 10 years, if anyone had any doubts of our common inheritance with the apes is that's completely nailed it. I mean, it's, it's about as certain as anything you can be in evolutionary biology. Now, genetic um, clock data, as well as, um, of course, fossils and, and other kinds of data, support this sort of out of the Africa hypothesis for the emergence of anatomically modern humans who evolved somewhere around 200,000 years ago um, in Africa and uh, spread within the African continent for about 130,000 years. And then the uh, big migration, big, might not have been that big, maybe a few hundred, a thousand people are thought to have emigrated from Africa in around 70,000 and then populated the world. And so they headed off sensibly, they didn't come up to cold Europe, but they headed towards the nice sunshine over here, kept going down India, China, um, down into Australia by, certainly by 60,000 uh, BC. And then other groups began to back up into Europe, the weather got better, never did get really good in England, but so they still kept going, and about 40,000 BC, you have the Cro-Magnon people here um, spreading out into Europe. And around 15,000 BC, you have people wading across the Bering Straits to come down and occupy this part of the world. So that's the sort of current picture of current anthropology. Again, in a nutshell, all we know about speciation suggests that the emergence of anatomically modern humans was a gradual process. It uh, probably took place over tens of thousands of years, uh, perhaps hundreds of thousands, most likely occurring in isolated small populations which got separated off from other populations. That's where speciation uh, is thought to occur. Unlike plants, which can speciate overnight by the simple process of chromosomal doubling, uh, we, of course, vertebrates take a bit longer. Okay, so that's a little bit of science in a nutshell. Now we come then to think about the fall, Adam and Eve narratives, and in conversation uh, with our current understanding of human evolution, is there a conversation that can be had? Well, some people say there shouldn't be a conversation, actually. It's like comparing um, anthropological apples with theological oranges. You know, you just can't do that kind of job. These are two quite separate kinds of discourse. But the fact does remain that at some point over the past tens, th hundreds of thousands of years, anatomically modern humans have emerged and at some point they must have started to know God when they couldn't know God before. I mean, I think it's a fact. We know chimpanzees don't know God and, you know, and so if we look at all our common ancestors, um, they probably didn't know God. But at some point humankind came to know God in a personal way. So I think for those interested in integrating their science with their faith, it seems at least a reasonable exercise to see if we can construct some models that would 
begin to um, help these two domains of knowledge, if you like, to talk to each other. Um, this is not some concordis exercise, let me emphasize, where we're trying to impose a scientific understanding upon theological texts, um, but simply a way of seeing if there can be bridges between these two forms of narrative that we can uh, hold with integrity. And I simply want to introduce three models. Um, I'm going to call them models A, B, and C, which I think um, can help us in doing that kind of a job. I'm sure there are more models, but I'm, we only have time for three today for discussion purposes. So model A is actually what I've called the ahistorical view, um, and this really ki kicks the whole discussion into touch, if you like. It, it basically says um, the purpose of the early chapters of Genesis is, is simply to provide this theological account um, of the status of humankind in relationship to God. We are fallen, we are separated from God's glory. Um, and so it doesn't really have anything to say at all about the origins of religious belief or personal knowledge of God. Um, the story of the fall in this context is the story of every man, every woman, and it's simply a myth in the technical sense of the word, a retelling, if you like, in theological terms of the uh, theological status of everybody today. We're all in the same boat. We are either in Adam or we are in Christ. And so it makes that contrast. It's a story, therefore, uh, interpretation that highlights the, uh, the spiritual death which is involved in separation from God, but doesn't want to pin it, make it in any sense into a historical account or even a proto-historical account. It wants to separate the two out. And so I call that the, uh, the no-bridge view. In other words, it's simply the two discourses don't really talk to each other at all. Okay, Model B, I've called a gradualist proto-historical view. Uh, this suggests that as anatomically modern humans emerged in Africa over the past sort of 200,000 years, or perhaps during some period of linguistic and cultural evolution since anatomically modern humans first emerged there, there was this gradual growing awareness of the claims of God upon their lives. It was a little bit like children now who instinctively, if you like, believe in God, uh, cognitive psychologists who, who would want to suggest that the default position of every child is, is belief in God, and there's quite a lot of good data for that. So that would be the sort of argument people would have, that as humankind emerged in this way, uh, they had a growing awareness of God and of his claims upon their lives, uh, but they turned away from that. They, they kind of rejected um, this knowledge of God that they had, but they rejected it as a gradual process. So the whole thing is about a process of emerging awareness of God's um, call upon their lives and an emergent, it, well, a, a process, if you like, of falling away from that and of rejecting um, God's claim upon their lives. And so then in that model, Genesis becomes, if you like, a retelling of that episode in the language of the Near East, which uh, Jewish people would understand and relate to and so forth and so on. So as with model A in this uh, kind of scenario, the Genesis account of Adam and Eve is a myth, again, in the technical sense of that word, albeit one that refers to putative events that did take place over a prolonged period of time during, during this early history of humanity in Africa. In model B, therefore, the fall is a process, as I say, happening over a long period of time. This model B, by the way, is um, held by uh, someone on our Faraday Institute Advisory Board, John Polkinghorne, um, in Cambridge, if you wanted a, a representative voice for that, uh, for that kind of view. Now, model C is more of an event-based proto-historical view, um, if you'd like. Uh, this moves now more in the direction of viewing the four as a specific event in time and in history. And in this kind of model, God, in his grace, chose um, a couple of Neolithic farmers in the Near East, 8,000 years ago, if you like, uh, a little bit more, and, or maybe it was a community of farmers, and he revealed himself in a special way, calling them into fellowship with himself so that they might know him as a personal God, as the one true God in distinction from the monotheism, uh, from the polytheism rather, that surrounded them, of course, at that time. It's not, therefore, in this model, suggesting there were no other settled farmers around. There were plenty of them. There were plenty of people living in Australia and China and India at the time. But God chose these people um, to, as it were, uh, be the progenitors of his new spiritual family on earth and indeed the progenitors of all those since that time who have come to know God by grace and, in that sense, the progenitors of, of I guess, all of us sitting in this room this afternoon. 
And it's for that reason 